What is up guys? Welcome back to another video. In this video we're looking at materials and I'm really excited about materials. One of the things I'm most passionate about, materials, architectural renderings, everything with materials. And we're going to start with Revit. Looking at all the different kinds of materials, what you can do with them in Revit, how they're applied to the programs, what they look like and everything. We're going to take a step-by-step -step approach in looking at materials and how to build them and how to get them to work functionally as far as data goes and as well as appearance goes. So in this video, we're actually first going to look at just the identity tab of the materials dialog box in Revit. And there's a lot to materials, but I want to break this down into parts because there are lots of different components that go into Revit materials that you may not necessarily see in other programs because there's a lot more going on with these materials in Revit versus other programs. So before we jump into it, if at any point in this video you happen to learn something or you just really enjoy it or you enjoy me or whatever it is, if you wouldn't mind, please liking the video. Please demolish that like button. It really helps me out a lot. So jumping right into it now, we're in the Manage tab and Materials. And it's as simple as that. We're going to look at Materials here. And as soon as we click on Materials, yeah, you get it. We're, we're looking at all our materials. And I have specifically in this project deleted every material and we're just looking at basic, basic materials that are either populated by Revit by default or just some that I've added in there just as placeholders. So right now, we don't even need to pay attention to any of these and just know that everything is gray and you don't need to worry about any kind of appearance at this point because we are specifically going to look at the identity tab in the Revit materials dialog box. So I want to first start by making a new material. So let's say we are making new material in hopes that this appears on our finished schedule. We're going to start applying this throughout our Revit model because it's an actual material that we're going to use in the project and we want to populate. So let's go ahead and rename this and just for the heck of it, let's call this C1 and we'll call this concrete. It's concrete. You're probably going to have some sort of concrete depending on the project. That's great. So of course our name is going to show up here again. We're in the identity tab. So our name will show up here and it's the exact same as that. We've got our description, our class, comments, keywords under the descriptive information, product information, all your manufacturer, model, cost, URL, whatever it is, and Revit annotation information, keynote, and mark. So all, I, really the only thing that needs to be said about all this information is that it's text. There's nothing really special about it. Now, of course, URL is it's kind of pointing to a, a web link. And so the idea is that this sends you to the manufacturer's website, something like that. But as far as I would say, it's really just all text and you're going to fill in all the information that you need to properly translate this material in your documents. Okay, that's great. But is there would I actually recommend using one or the other uh, using this kind of information or just regular text in a, a schedule, a, a dummy schedule? Like what's the advantage of doing like going to the trouble and filling out all this information in a Revit material? Well, no matter where you apply the material, it's going to carry this information. That's not just the identity data, but the graphics and appearance as well. But for this video, we're looking at identity data and identity being all the descriptive information about that material. The reason you'd want to actually go to the trouble of doing this is so one, it'll populate everywhere, of course, but by filling in this information and then applying the material to actually anything in your project, and I say anything because there is an asterisk there, of course, there are a number of things that if you apply that to that type of object in Revit, it will not populate on a schedule. That is very specific and I'm not going to get into that right now, but regardless, applying a material to anything in the Revit project will then allow you to pull that information and all the information you've gone to the trouble of adding to this material and have that populate into a finished schedule. And we're going to start to look at that a little bit towards the end of this video because all this information does tie in directly to the finished schedule. So again, you have the option of choosing which of these you want to use, what kind of information you want to put in there. Most of the time I'm using very few of these, you know, I obviously want to use the manufacturer, uh, if there's a specific model, that's great. A lot of times I don't, I don't go to the trouble or don't see a lot of people going to the trouble of adding a URL. It, but if, you know, if it's my project, I would say fill out as much of this as you can, because it's of course useful information. 
Another question you might have is what's the difference between description and comments? Well, actually nothing because it's just text data. And these are all default fields that Revit provides you when it comes to these materials. It's kind of up to you to use this to your liking. Now I will show you at the end of this video, a sample of a finish schedule that I use myself and how all of this is organized. And I'll say I've a completely separate video for building that schedule and organizing in a way that deals with all the materials that you might need to. So let's start looking at all these again. Most of these are, are text, but class is a little different. If you, if you look at the drop down here, these are all the just generic out of the box, different classes of materials. And again, there's nothing special about this. It's just text. But what I would say is that this should align with the type of material, because if you actually look here, there's a way of filtering this, these sets, all the materials in your project by class. And right now, all, all these materials are only generic or unassigned as far as their class goes, which is kind of silly, but regardless, that's kind of what they are. So let's go ahead and change this to concrete. And again, I can always type, you know, all caps concrete or, or C O N, whatever you want to call it. And it will populate that way. So when I look at my filter again, I can see concrete and I can filter just by concrete. That's one, one easy way of doing it. So I can look at all of them there that way. So I would, I would highly recommend that you start to fill in this information, not only so it populates in your finish schedule, but so it begins to organize your materials in your project. Keywords is a great way of doing this as well. Again, I probably call this concrete because what it is, there might be other descriptions for a type of concrete that you use in a project, but for now it's just concrete. And this will simply allow me to search for concrete and have this material populate. Nothing too special about that. This is not necessarily going to, you, know, you wouldn't necessarily want that to populate in your finish schedule just because you're using this to search your materials here. So finally, I would say what the, the most important thing of all of this really is the mark. And I say mark because if you're, if you've used doors and you created door schedules or anything that requires a mark, a mark value, a having a mark value is kind of a, a Revit standard of applying to schedules. It basically says if by default, if an element has a mark value or you assign a mark value to it, then it's supposed to populate on a schedule. That's not that, you know, of course can not necessarily be the case at all times, depending on how the schedules are set up, but I'd highly recommend you use that when it comes to building your finish schedules. So what would I call this mark? Well, I, I'd call this C dash one because it's concrete one and that's about it. You know, you can, I wouldn't necessarily put in concrete here. I would save that information for somewhere else because this mark is going to be what is used to start to organize your finish schedule. So we've looked at all, all of this information because it's just text. You, you fill it in as you need it. You know, maybe your firm decides that you want description to be the, the last field in all your materials and you're going to just put all your notes there. Or maybe, maybe that's comments, whatever it is. It doesn't, it does not matter. You can always use any of these in really any way that you want. You can always change the name of them, at least not, not here, but in your finish code, you can change the name of the headers. So they're called something else technically while it's still pulling this data. I'll save that for the finish schedule video, but. We've looked at all this as far as the text goes. Now let's look at maybe wanting to add more of these because maybe you say, well, I have all the information I need here, but I have some specific materials that require something specific. I, it could be a particular style or a size or dimensions, whatever it might be. You might want to add something specific to this. And I've actually covered this in a separate video as well that I will link now in the cards above. It is to project parameters and what you're, going to want to do is add a material project parameter and all that will do is simply allow you to have more fields that you can work with to add text or really whatever you want and you'll find these if we look in our materials dialog box at the bottom left here we can see custom parameters it is right here if you click custom parameters you can see all the different parameters that you have built into your project that apply to materials and you can clearly see here material parameters these are all the material parameters now this looks like a lot and in a sense kind of is, but you could also begin to see how this might be helpful in having all this information also tied to a material. So one thing to remember is that all these parameter values, all these different parameters and their values just being text, all these are text operate in the exact same way as all this information does in the Revit material itself. 
you can almost imagine that all this information here is just an extension to the identity field within the material. And that's why I'm talking about it in this video because it, it does apply the same and can apply the same to your finish schedule. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll have a material that has all this information filled out and all this information filled out and this all of this information as a whole is used to populate on the finish schedule. So I've gone through this in a separate video in creating these material parameters, but I want to do that again in this video because we're specifically looking at the material identity data. So I'm going to hit OK, and I'll hit OK, and we've got our new concrete material. So let's go to our project parameters. And th there's a bunch here, and you know these are tied to different things, whether it's doors or whatnot, but let's go ahead and add a new one, and let's call this let's just call this notes, you know, cause maybe you want one called notes. Obviously we have comments, descriptions. We've got a lot to work with already, but that's okay. So the first thing I need to do is simply check materials. So I'll come over here and I'll check materials. So that tells the parameter that this is specifically for materials. Now you can start to apply this to other things, but for the purposes of what we want to do for the finish schedule and apply notes to a material, we only really need to work with materials in this case. So this parameter will show up only with materials. And again, we don't want this to be a length. We want this to be text. So let's simply call that text. It's going to, the type will now be text. And then this will also be grouped under text. All of this information is fine. Instance is fine because it's a specific material. That's great. You want to group it by type. Of course, that's fine. We'll hit OK. There we go. Of course, I already have one called notes. So let's just call this material notes right there material notes okay so as soon as i do that i can see it populated there perfect i'll hit okay now let's go back to our materials and our manage tab and now when i come down to custom parameters we can now see material notes populates right there and again it operates the same as all of these in that i can add text information that will then show up on my finish schedule once I pull in and use this parameter, use this field in my schedule. So with all this in mind, let's start to look at our finish schedule. I'll hit OK, and under material takeoff there, I've got finish schedule. And this is just how I organize it. I'm not gonna go into this specific organization or any really anything in this video other than setting up or just showing you the result of what you might be able to get or might want to get from all your material identity data and have that populate in a finish schedule. So here's all my information. I, again, I have no materials applied to the project, but I did just make that basic concrete material. So let's actually go apply that to a surface in my model. So I've got a, a number of walls here. Let's just add it to this wall. So I'll edit the type here, edit the structure, and let's just make this structure that concrete. So there's my concrete. I'll hit OK. Perfect. And there we go. It's now applied. And now we know that it's applied if we look back at our finish schedule and see there it is, my mark value. My mark value there is C1. And I, that tells me that it's populated. And of course, I don't see any information filled in because, in fact, I don't have any of that information filled in in the identity data. But let's go ahead and do that just for the heck of this. Comments. I'm just going to type in comments so we can see this. And as soon as I hit apply, we can see comments shows up right there under the comments field. Now, remember, you can you can change the name of any of these column headers, which can be a bit deceiving if someone does change the name of one of them, because it might be pulling comments, but called the size or something like that. I obviously be careful doing that, of course, because that may or may not be what you want. So that's that's just an example of that, of course. We've got manufacturer. We can do the same thing with really anything. And as soon as we hit apply, it's going to show up there as manufacturer. Perfect. So before you might have seen that a couple of these boxes were red. And the idea there is that I've used some conditional formatting. So we can see that if we look into, if we go to the formatting within our schedule, and then conditional formatting. And this conditional format is based on the field that I'm looking at. So again, I had... I had the manufacturer field, so material manufacturer there. And if I look at conditional formatting, I've actually set to where if the value of the field equals nothing in this case, then I have the background color be red. Okay, easy enough, that works. And the only reason I'm showing you this is just to say that if you've set conditional formatting to any one of the fields 
that show up by default within a Revit material in the identity data, anything here, the conditional formatting will work. <laughs> now, if I were to actually apply that conditional formatting to any one of my material parameters or custom material parameters, new project parameters that I've created for the purposes of a material populated in the finish schedule, those would not carry any of the conditional formatting. I don't understand why it makes no sense. It's just another field, but for some reason, because it's not the default material identity data parameters that are built into Revit, it's just not going to work. So I, I don't have another answer for that, but I'm basically telling you because I want you to know. So if I look at contact person and the conditional formatting, I have the background color set to red with it equal to no value. And if you look here, the contact person is currently blank. There's nothing there. There's no space, no anything, and it's white. It just goes to show that the conditional formatting does not work for custom parameters. It's too bad, but there you go. So that will do it for this video. Again, in this video, we looked at all of the material identity data. Not a whole lot there, but it's text. And then we also looked at how all of this information populates within a finished schedule. And I have it set up to where it's pulling from the mark value. And I want to look into this more in, in a more detailed way in another video, looking at making a finished schedule from scratch, setting it up with all this information and all of these different custom parameters so we can get the desired look that we want in our finished schedule. I know that's really important to get it right because, you know, just having materials right is really helpful. And all of that information lives within this materials dialog box in the manage tab of the materials. So again, that will do it for this video. I sure hope you enjoyed it. Stick around for the other videos coming out. We'll look at specifically the graphics tab as well as the appearance and dive a lot more into materials when it comes to Revit, applying them to our project, making our project just look good. When it comes to exporting our projects and going into other, other programs, taking our materials with us, there's a lot that we need to cover with materials. Materials is a passion of mine and you're going to see a lot with materials. So I hope you enjoyed this introduction. If you did and you learned something, please demolish that like button. It really helps me out a lot. Also, please consider changing the phase of that subscribe button to existing. That also helps me out so much. If you stuck around this long in the video, you're awesome. Thank you very much for doing that. I sure hope to see you in the next one. Have a wonderful day and thanks for watching.